Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So the title of my talk is Real vs. Uh, Realistically Rendered Ground Truth. So my main aim is performance analysis with all these techniques and especially for optical flow. So I'll be talking uh, about can we use computer graphics for optical flow evaluation. So the talk will consist of three parts. First part is a magical black box, you will see it soon. Then I will talk about the state of the synthetic art. And finally I will talk about different ways to generate ground truth. So first step is the magical black box. What do we want to do? Um, we do have some real data without ground truth. We want to put it into this box and then we want to see a quality prediction. We want to see how good will our given algorithm work with this data. This is our aim. And of course we need some uh, information. We will definitely, definitely need existing algorithms. This is the first big problem. And there are very few implementations, for example, for optical flow, I will show you in a second. Um, performance measures are also very important. For example, the mean endpoint error is not always the, criteria, the best criterion for finding out whether uh, an algorithm really works, an optic flow algorithm really works. And we need reference data. And um, then we put this all into our evaluation software, which is still to be found. And I will concentrate on the reference data. And there are three important points. It should be meaningful, accurate, and exhaustive. And these are very difficult uh, goals to, uh, to achieve. So now we'll talk about the performance analysis part, the state of the art. Um, I did a Google Scholar keyword search on optical flow and optic flow uh, in the full time. So 1981 was the first very well-known paper, papers, two of them. And I didn't search for patterns, and I searched for the text anywhere in the article. And it does not include stuff where people use terms like registration, which is in Lucas and Canale, the first local method. And one poll, how many uh, papers on optical flow have you read? Uh, who read more than 10 papers on optical flow? Yeah, who read more than 100? OK. So um, unfortunately, there are uh, the number of publications where the term is in the article, 16,300 papers, only in engineering, computer science, and mathematics. So there's a lot of research going on. But of course, this is a Google Scholar result. It's based on histograms, SQL based on histograms. So it's not an accurate result. So let's try to refine this a bit. Um, last year, I looked at this data, and I only looked at the four major conferences. Uh, PAMI, IJCB, not conferences, uh, um, journal, uh, journals. PAMI, IJCB, Transactions and Image Processing, Computer Vision and Image Understanding. I thought these were four where you very often find optical flow. Um, you find around 1,500. And this year, just on Monday, I tried another search while I was bored at the airport, um, 128 new ones. So there are lots of um, publications. Um, if you look for publications in the, in the title, so where optical flow appears in the title, so this might be a very safe guess to say this really has to do with optical flow. Um, you will find 3,000 papers in, in these topics, uh, in these, yeah, in these topics. And in the journals, you won't find uh, 150. So there are at least, I would say, 150 or 142 papers dealing with optical flow alone. And the question is, which is the algorithm you want to use for your specific application? And this is a question I'm always asked by people from industry, uh, especially, for example, Bosch and other companies we are working with together. And um, I never can, I'm never able to give an answer. So if you look at the uh, number of publications per year, um, you will see it's almost an exponential growth. You see around 10 years after the first publication, it's around the 500 mark. Another 10 years on, it's 1,500. And then another um, 10 years on, it's about 3,000. So there's a huge growth in the number of publications. And this is a big motivation why we really need performance analysis to choose which algorithm is good. And if you look at the evaluation papers, there are four. Um, one question, do you know any more of these papers? Sometimes they are well hidden or in, in a given paper there is some included um, remarks on performance analysis in general, something like that. So in case you know something, approach me later on. Um, I just know these four papers and the most uh, famous ones are the Barron and Fleet paper and the Middlebury dataset paper. These are very well known. 
So the evaluation strategy usually is uh, you have black box testing, so you take some scenes, put them into your full algorithm, and then see, look at the endpoint error. And the endpoint error is very often only evaluated by means of mean and variance. Um, in the Middlebury data set, there's lots of more information, but it's uh, very seldomly cited or re referenced. So question will remain which methods apply to my specific problem. So with four evaluation papers um, and all the new papers in the past years, this is difficult to find out. So let's have a look what the real world is. Um, this is a scene from Cloverfield with sound, so I will be quiet for a second. So, first question, do you consider the sequence as the real world? Who does consider this as the real world? That's a good thing. Because, yeah, it's, you could say it's a real world. There's actually CG in the background, and then it's based on an infrared camera, so it's no like RGB data or something. There's motion blur, extremely fast motions, lots of uh, over, uh, over blooming and stuff like that. And so you can't really, if you want to estimate optical flow here, you will fail definitely. There's no chance. Um, so we have to define what the real world is and what problems we really want to solve. And this is not solved if you just say we have a new <coughs> optical flow algorithm. We do not say uh, we solve uh, all the real world problems you might have. And there will be re situations where you have a very specific model for a very specific thing, and then it works very well. And you should use the specific model. You should be as specific as possible. Um, okay, so sometimes the answer is clear, of course, uh, if you know the application. And very often, um, optical flow models are um, proposed without an application in mind. Uh, which are the applications? This is uh, difficult. It might be a controversial um, discussion because um, there are some very well-known applications, um, like, for example, um, tracking of fluids in, uh, in measurement sciences. There you use optical flow, and that's a very well-defined application. Um, of course, there are many others. Um, question is, what is the relevant reference data for this one? And I think this is still an open problem with application, even if you have the application in mind. And what I want to do with all these slides here is I want to um, make you think about what, what are the actual definitions of these problems and what are the actual goals, and this is often unclear. So let's have a state of the art. Um, 1994, the Yosemite sequence, everybody knows this sequence was proposed seven frames long. And here I found on YouTube, I found a video of the actual Yosemite Valley. And um, from just from the reality, the, the difference is big, of course. But it's interesting to see because here you have completely different problems. You have very abrupt uh, camera motions when you are flying through the scene. And here we assume we are flying through the scene. You have uh, all these uh, light effects, then you have some, some problems with the white balance and stuff like that. So if you want to compute on this one, especially with all the JPEG artifacts and so on, this will be much more difficult. But this is sure, this is uh, clear. Another thing will be in 2007, we had some synthetic sequences. We have the growth sequence, again, seven frames created by the guys from Veta Digital. Um, then we have a real scene, and we could argue whether we really want to have an application in the forest. I think there are a few applications where you want to estimate optical flow in the forest. But this is more how it looks in reality. And in the same year, Crisis was um, published. And Crisis renders in real time extremely complex scenes in computer graphics, which are much more complex than our test scenes. So why don't we use this one? Nobody ever thought about it. And we can get optical flow here as well in real time. Um, same with the urban scene. Um, there is a synthetic scan of Munich by Reality Maps. It's a company, um, and here we have a fly through. Here we have the test scene, um, which is urban, some, so to say. And then we have some real scene. Of course, we all know this automotive applications, uh, which look much more difficult. Here we fly again. The camera flies again. Why do cameras always fly in synthetic scenes? That doesn't make much sense, I guess. So this is about the state of the art. What we tried, what many people try, record our own data. So um, what did we do? We took 15 stereo outdoor data sets, which means we got, went out at 15 different dates of the year um, in four different seasons. And we took about <coughs> 70 different GPS triggered locations. So in one town, we have 70 locations of different complexity and different kinds, like autobahn and uh, in the town or just outside the town and so on. 
And um, each sequence has about uh, 1,600 frames and recorded these data with uh, 100 hertz a large, uh, in a large resolution and 12 bits of accuracy. And the data is indexed, annotated, and rectified. And with rectification, I mean it's both radiometrically as, um, as well as geometrically rectified for stereo. Um, uh, the only comparable data set now is the one recorded by Klette et al. in New Zealand. And they have, uh, they have color images. They have uh, a slightly different approach to all the data. Um, and the result is um, this data has little in common with what I just showed you. This is uh, the big point. But what do we do with the data? So first, we will show, I show you a few examples. Here you see the scene as we recorded it. And here you've seen a downsampled version as uh, you would with a regular camera, 600 times four, 640, 480, and 25 hertz. And then you see some, some CV differences. So we do have much more detail here. You see all the snow flying, here you don't. So we can use this information to try to get, uh, to infer more, more um, data um, and see um, what we can do with this. Um, we took this in, in four different uh, times of the year. So here you see four sequences uh, taken in uh, winter, in spring, in summer, and in autumn. And um, this is also interesting because you see all the variability. So that changes a lot here in winter. You have all the snow. And uh, here you have trees which are just uh, getting their leaves out. And here you have the leaves. And um, so in each situation, the same scene looks very different. And we wanted to capture this variability um, during the year and during the day and so on. So um, this is good. But recording a lot of data does not equal selecting representative data. So how do we choose from these 16 terabyte? Ideally, we would have a low dimensional orth orthogonal basis of scenes within one application domain, which is unlikely to, to happen. And the next problem is when, once we selected this data, we need to create reference data. So how can we create reference data which really helps to evaluate the algorithms? And that's yet another problem. So first selection and then creating the ground truth. How do we obtain ground truth? One option is. We have high resolution in space and time. This is what we did in the past years. And um, then you could downsample. I'm not a fan of that. Um, the results to create a virtually higher accuracy. This has also been done by the Middlebury data set, for example. There was a block matching approach on this fluorescent um, paint, which was painted onto the scenes. And then the, scene, the, uh, the sequences or the images were very large. And then they were downsampled to, to another um, size. And this made a lot of sense, and it had a big impact. In our case, it's much more difficult because in these scenes, we have lots of problems with the models of optical flow or even we can't do any exhaustive search, to put it in a nutshell. Another option will be um, to create additional data from more accurate sensors. We do have an inertial sensor. We can use time of flight. We can use stereo. We can use all the 3D reconstruction stuff. We can use Connect Fusion, for example. And then we have much more data. This data is all integrated. And then we could get a very exact two depth maps for two frames. And from these two depth maps, we can reproject given a camera and create flow apparent uh, uh, motion on each pixel. So this is also one very interesting option. Then we do have the artificial real world created in the lab, as we saw it in the Middlebury data set for the real sequences. Um, there's also pre 3D printing and very controlled light and so on. So this is also useful to get some, some basic stuff uh, done. And finally, um, we can use simulations, i.e. computer graphics, based on real recordings. And this is our long-term goal. So what we want to see is whether computer graphics can actually um, make up um, to, or be so close to reality that computer vision algorithms are not able to, to tell the difference. So we will have one computer vision algorithm, who's the judge. And then we have two guys, two data sets. One is the real one, and one is the synthetically recreated one. And then we will see, like in the Turing tests, whether um, there is a difference. So will the computer vision algorithm yield the same results? So reference data. There are three types of reference data. This is why I say reference data and not ground truth. Um, we could have reference data without ground truth, as I just showed you. And I will come to back this back in a second. Um, then we might have weak ground truth, which is, for example, the work of Sil Liu, where you have human-assisted motion annotation, which was very useful, and we based some work on that. And um, then we have ground truth. And then the question will be, how accurate is it, and so on. So 
I'm organizing um, ECCV workshop. It's proposed, but of course not yet submitted, submitted for the ECCV next year. And um, we created data sets which are extremely difficult. You will not be able to estimate um, dense correspondences on these. So we have stereo sequences. Um, in these stereo sequences, you will have different kinds of problems. Here you have lots of motion. Here you have, for example, here you see the cars flashing snow around. You have all the, the, all the snowflakes flying around and so on. So what motion do you want to estimate? Or what's the, what is the best stereo? Here you see all these light effects you get when you go from left to right. And we will have a jury which comes from industry with different application sets in mind. I've been on CVMP um, this week. So there are lots of people from the media industry. Then we have corporations with, for example, Bosch, and they have uh, driver assistance uh, in their mind. And these are, so this is called Bosch uh, Challenge because um, this is um, with them we took the data. And in these sequences you see um, motion estimation and stereo will not really work, but it might be possible under some circumstances. Here, for example, you see lots of reflections by the cars parking. And so here motion will be induced, which you actually do not want to see. There is apparent motion, but we do not want to have this motion. So if you could have a good ex intrinsic image, we were just talking about this topic, um, perhaps we could get rid of this stuff. Here you see the shadows on the back of the truck, or here you see lens flares, stuff like that. So this is real evil, and um, <laughs> the, the, jury, the jury will therefore not, we do not use ground truth here because it's obvious if uh, algorithms fail, and the jury will look at if this is somehow useful, if the results of, of, the, of the submission or the, the ideas the authors come up with are useful in a practical context. So for example, if we detect that um, there is, uh, here is a mirroring of the truck, if we detect this and say, here we do have two layers of motion, so we cannot estimate motion with our models. This would be fine. Or if you just say in the snow sequence, uh, this is too complex motion, so we will not be able to estimate this reliably. This would also be fine. So our aim is really to challenge researchers um, to go beyond what the current models are and then have the jury um, decide what's good for applications. So you're invited to look at this web page. Um, there are also other data sets. We had, I probably have to take this offline again soon because there, we had some problems with German laws of privacy. And uh, there are some, for example, here, you sometimes can see um, the, the, uh, the, the um, what's it called? Okay. Yeah, the license, uh, license plate here. And um, so we have to remove these before we can put it online and so on. So there are some problems going, coming. But I will have it online next week. On this website, we want to also host other data sets. There already are some other data sets. One of these data sets um, comes from an ICCV publication we just presented last week. And so here you will find uh, what we will produce in the future. It's the same URL here. Um, oh, yeah, one important thing I want to tell you about, and you probably haven't heard about it because it's very young, IPOL, Image Processing Online. <coughs> it's a journal where you submit a description of an algorithm which you not have published, or you might have published, but you don't have to have, 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 to have published it. And um, you submit the sub description of the algorithm, the technical description, and the code. And this is being peer-reviewed and certified, and then put online for download. And there's a lot of papers online already, and it's a great journal. I do not only say this because I'm one of the technical editors here, <laughs> but it's a great thing because you get a lot of ground truth, not ground truth, it's, you get a lot of implementation. So my next step, when I want to have, when I got this, all this data, I will have to try all these 200 optical flow algorithms and work with them and see what's best and what are the characteristics of these algorithms. And then I need the implementations. And in my lifetime, I will never be able to implement so many um, optical flow algorithms. So I really want to encourage you. It's a, a regular journal. So it's peer reviewed. You get a DOI and an ISN. And um, so if you have some code, which is very small portion of code, just a basic algorithm, not like a full application framework, um, you can submit it here and get a, one more publication. and. Uh, very good, uh, um, very good thing um, for for the rest of the uh, research community. This stuff you know, so I will just talk very shortly about it. What we did, one approach is create weak ground truth here. So you have the sequence, do feature tracking, get a, uh, a sparse reconstruction, and then you can use this for ground truth generation by reprojecting based on the camera matrices. 
This was work of a diploma thesis, which has just been done. This guy is now doing his PhD thesis, trying to make this dense. And of course, this sounds like uh, Kinect Fusion and stuff. Um, he's a bit more concerned with media production, so he also wants to do 2D to 3D conversion when there, are no inf when there is no information at all about the depth. For example, a standing camera and a guy walking through it. Um, then you also might need some depth maps for, for medias, media production. And in these circumstances, this is what he will now focus on. Another option which we just tried, oh, that's pretty dark. Um, we had a look at the code uh, written by Sir Liu. He published it online, and I think um, now he got at least one more citation by us, uh, so it's useful to publish code online. <laughs> um, what we did, we took our scenes I just showed you, and we annotated a single frame, and then we ran, so let's just start this video, in his, in his software, um, then we um, segmented this, and then you see as the, the boundaries are not tracked correctly, of course, by, by the software, it's a rudimentary approach. But what we do is, we export these annotations, we edit a button up here, and they are exported to Mechanical Turk, as you know from the LabelMe database, for example, it's a very famous um, publication on this topic. And then online, the user, um, we created we, a slightly different interface, we used some of the code of the LabelMe database and so on. And um, then the user is asked to um, read the guidelines first, of course, so he, we really get what we want. And then he can um, zoom in on our scene, and then he's able to correct this stuff. Um, this is done by some, you can see a contrast enhancement of this, which doesn't look good, but it's very helpful to get the contours correct. <coughs> then you um, can um, use um, your mouse to change the whole location of the, of the boundary. You can see it very well here, but so you just move around and then you submit your, your hit. It's called human intelligence task for those of you who don't know what Amazon Mechanical Turk is. Um, then we get an XML file, which we just import in our ground truth annotation tool, which we got from Liu, And um, then we do have results here. This was, took 20 hours, so we just annotated the first frame. Um, then we uploaded it, and 20 hours later we got the results. We paid 12 US dollar for 50 frames, and now we have um, a very nice annotation. And the same goes with the feature point um, description or detection, which um, is the other part of the software of Silio, where we um, do um, the dense or relatively dense um, feature point uh, um, correspondence estimation, a human one. And then we have about, like, <coughs> say, 5,000 uh, feature points which are annotated manually. And then we use this information to use the same algorithms as he did. And then we will try to validate this stuff. So I think this is an upcoming publication because we have to look at whether this really works and if this ground truth is useful. And this will be the part of science now. This just took a few weeks for implementation. So if you want to have reference data with ground truth, um, we did several tries. And this is not the most recent slides uh, I can show you. We, we have some more, some more recent data. But in 2009, the first thing we did um, we created, uh, we took an image of a real scene. I'm not sure, I think this is a real image. Um, so we took some shots, it's a turntable, so we wanted to have some very constrained motion, it's a sequence, and we wanted to have some relatively simple materials which are textured, which was a big problem because these are not simple, these materials. And um, then we tried to recreate this in, uh, with computer graphics in Blender. So we drive this manually. So we measured the size of the block and stuff like that and the location. We manually um, recorded the textures. And we, For example, I, I thought, I do a lot of photography in my free time, and I thought, um, <coughs> okay, let's take my cool camera um, to record the textures and then apply them in the rendering. And we found out this is a very bad problem because the um, MTF, the, the transfer function of my camera, is a completely different one than the cameras we used. And so the textures look vastly different. So this didn't work. This is what you see here. Um, this is a texture recorded with my camera. And um, later on, we recorded these textures um, with the same camera. And this worked much better. And another problem was lighting. So how to get the light correct. We um, used, on purpose, we used an LED array of five LEDs. So we have point light sources, which we can simulate. Finding these locations uh, wasn't that easy, even if we, if we tried it manually. So this all we got, and it didn't really uh, work out well. So it took another year until we had all this data. One student was working on this. First he did his uh, master, and now he's a PhD student as well. Um, 
And um, a poll question, which of these now is the real image? Any idea? Who votes this one is the real image? Okay, Carsten. Who thinks this one is the real image? Okay, who thinks this one is the real image? And who thinks this one is the real image? I, was, I think it was perfectly a uniform distribution. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> this one is the real one here. And you don't see the difference, but the algorithm, the computer, uh, the optical flow algorithm, we used just the TVL1 version of the University of Graz here. Um, <laughs> they noticed the difference a lot. I will show you in a second. Um, then we use a 3D scanner because we thought, okay, we need a very accurate um, um, geometry. This was hand-measured geometry and it wasn't very exact. So we had like one pixel difference here and so on. So we took a, this five, 50 microns accurate scanner and scanned objects. For example, this one, this is a, a masterpiece, so-called masterpiece when you have an apprenticeship in Germany. You have to create this mechanically. And this is the real one and this is the synthetic one. And here in the synthetic one, we now did not fine-tune the materials. So here you see a completely different material. This is aluminum with some kind of very special uh, treatment. Um, and um, here you, we just tried to tweak parameters in Blender, which didn't work at all. And so this is the next problem. So the next two slides will be problems with this one and how we solve this material problem. Then I'm, then I'm almost done. Okay, first the numbers. You see um, for the different sequences the end average endpoint error. You know this average endpoint error is not perfectly um, meaningful, but it's at least a guess now for, to, get it, to get a rough idea. I will show you detailed, um, a detailed slide in the next slide. What you see is uh, we tried different regularization strengths, which was the only parameter we write. Um, the other parameters we just optimized to get the, get, uh, the best results, like pyramid levels and stuff. And um, so here we get um, the best results, or the roughly the best results on, on average. <coughs> and um, if you take a minimum realism, no shadows and just diffuse shaders, you get a very low endpoint error. And if we take a realistic rendering, the more realistic we become, the higher the endpoint error becomes. But you see the variance is much larger than the mean error, so this, the, this mean is not so meaningful. And um, up here, this is the real, the ground truth um, which we used for the real sequence, and then we get this error. So you see, the more realistic you become, the better or the closer you get to this data. Yeah, objections. <laughs> no, what are the units? Um, this is in pixels, the endpoint error in pixels. Yeah. And I just said objections because you can object to this stuff, um, because um, the ground truth, for example, here is ground truth which we generated for the scene. So we matched the scenes and then used this as ground truth. So, so this is just a uh, first, first order estimate of the ground truth. Yeah? So, I mean, if, if these are pixels, they're very low rate, and even with the variance, what are the maximum errors? Like, do they become something like... Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Um, here you see the spatial distribution of the errors. Everything what is white is more than one pixel, and we consider this as very bad. So I don't know what the maximum error was, but it was in the order of two pixels or three pixels or something like that. And it most likely was at the boundaries where there was no perfect match. And so we didn't, so if the boundary is not correct and the ground truth doesn't perfectly transfer to the other image, this doesn't work well. On the other hand, you have all these planar um, spaces where the ground truth um, is, is very good approximated, even if there's a small spatial um, mismatch. What you see is on the real sequence, the endpoint error looks like this. So here you have all these high errors. There's low contrast, and this table is rotating. The TVL1, the L1 norm, just um, encourages uh, uh, locally or um, stepwise or piecewise constant fields. So you will get all these, these artifacts here because um, it has to be piecewise constant, but this is rotating. So this is a contradiction of the model and the data. Yeah? Sorry, so the ground truth is different for A. It's the same ground truth in all frames. It's the same ground truth, but for the synthetic scenes, the ground truth is perfect. And if we apply this synthetic ground truth to the real scene, which have been geometrically aligned as good as we could, so the ground truth is the same, but you could argue that, of course, due to the mismatch of the geometrical alignment of the real and the synthetic scene, there is also a mismatch in the ground truth. Especially when you think that the difference is one pixel at most. Yeah. Definitely. 
But but just to be clear, sorry, so the ground truth on the rotating circular plane is exactly consistent with the rotating circular plane. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So we will have problems at the boundaries because there might be it might be one pixel off. This was a preliminary uh, preliminary uh, experiment to see um, whether we can get to to this accuracy at all. So this is the most important question, and if m more realism helps to get better results. Uh, one more question. Okay, so I'll just continue with this, and then we will see. Um, so this is the real result, and you see that the very nature of this endpoint <coughs> error distribution is very different to all the synthetic scenes. This is the uh, one with uh, the minimum realism. So for example, here you see that the shadows, which are not there, are no problem. So you can easily um, estimate motion here. And here at this boundary, uh, you can get very low errors, actually. On top, you will always have aliasing problems, because you have um, a texture which is turned around to a very slanted angle. And then the aliasing is much different than, from a real camera, uh, than in a real camera up here. And you also see at texture boundaries, we put this boundary on, on this side here. And um, this causes a lot of error, a lot of error, because um, there you get a, a larger gradient. You don't see it with the eye, really. But the gradient is here larger, so it's a stronger impact on the regularization, uh, on, the, on the data term, which means that the regularization is weaker, and so on. And then you get um, errors like these. So <clears throat> what we see, the algorithm actually sees a lot of difference. This is one point. We can get close to reality, so to say, when we say, see at, uh, look at the mean endpoint error. And we, with uh, increasing realism, we can get closer. So this was our first very basic check, whether this is uh, a good idea to, to um, go on in this direction. And I think it um, is a good idea to go on in this direction. There's one short question. Real versus synthetic data, as I just showed to you, I tried to find citations on this, and I just found a very few to none. So in case you know any citations, perhaps from the computer graphics community or from photogrammeters or other communities where people do something like that, perhaps you can drop me a mail and tell me so I get my citations correctly. So I really want to have a very thorough references on this topic. Next step is get the material right. Um, getting the material right uh, means, from our point of view, measuring <coughs> Um, all parameters of not only BRDFs, for example, even uh, spatially varying BRDFs or texture transfer functions and so on. So we built this device and um, this device <coughs> consists of a few um, motors. So here you have a turntable. Then here this axis can also be Here's rotated. Mine. Oh, there's sound in there. Um, then you have this axis where a camera is attached. So this camera can move uh, in this direction. And we have LED light sources, which can be exchanged or replaced. So we have RGB and also infrared, because we want to measure the transfer functions for um, time-of-flight cameras as well, to simulate um, synthetic time-of-flight data to be able to see, to simulate the full camera model. This is what Mirko Schmidt did a lot in his work, so we want to continue this work here. And um, these LEDs here are, um, can be controlled, and you can choose um, for example, you can just let it walk around in, in how many columns you want and so on. So this was a huge uh, uh, engineering effort. It took about one year to build it. And now it's just working. Just working means um, the intensities here have to be calibrated more correctly and uh, the angular resolution of this stuff is not so repeatable as we would like it to have. And we are working on this, and it looks like there will be another PhD student now. The guy who built this in his master thesis will most probably um, become a PhD student because he did a great job here. Doing, doing this in half a year is, is an amazing job. It's, it was really difficult. And yeah, what we want to do with this, what we are working together, for example, with Alexander Wilkies from Prague. He's a very good computer graphics guy who's trying real versus synthetic from the computer graphics community. Um, the group of uh, Markus Magnoa in Braunschweig. There is Kai Berger, who also does a lot of stuff like this. We actually wanted to submit s this uh, stuff on the CBPR, but we didn't have enough time to get good results. So um, we have to do it next time. Um, and Kai Berger is one of the guys from the computer graphics community who's working together with us. And then there's also Philipp Slusalek, who's a very important ray tracing guy in Saarbrücken. And we just submitted a, a proposal on continuing working on this topic. So. We really want to put a lot of emphasis on doing this real versus synthetic challenge. So this is very important to us. 
And if everything goes well, I will be a permanent postdoc and uh, work there for the next 15 years on this topic. But this is still uh, to be decided, of course. So conclusion. Um, observations, existing sequences are not really real. We could argue that. It depends on the application, and we have to know the application, of course. Creating real sequences with ground truth is extremely difficult, especially if we want to go outdoors, and this is our goal, to go outdoors in the end. And computer graphics are not fully utilized. You saw all the differences between the sequences which are used in Middlebury and the synthetic data which was available at the same time um, which was not used. So there's a lack of communication be between computer graphics guys and computer vision guys. And I think this is currently converging to the term of visual computing. And we are part of the Intel Visual Computing Lab as well, working together with the guys in Saarbrücken. So we really hope that this is going um, to, to be emphasized more in the future. And it is unclear which sequences we need. We need to select data. We need not only to take any arbitrary scenes where we say, oh, well, there's a little bit of structure. This is, a, oh, over there. This is a very difficult BRDF, or it's reflecting, so we can't really record it. So put this all together arbitrarily, and then say, well, this is a good test scene. We have to find, theoretically, sounds, sound means of estimating whether this is a good test scene or not. And I think there is no research at all on this topic, at least in our field of research. Of course, other people, for, exa for example, perhaps even from learning, there might be people who really did this already. Our dilemma is our data is either too artificial, if we do it fully synthetically, then we have good ground truth but bad data, or the ground truth is too inaccurate if we have real sequences. So we have to place ourselves, we have to find a location where we want to sample from. And I try everything, I try to uniformly sample at the moment, and I will focus on the most promising stuff as, as soon as I am sure what to do next. So, Performance analysis are badly needed, so all the companies we work with ask what should we do, which method should we use, and so on. And I just, I had a very little, uh, I had a job um, for a lawyer, and this lawyer wanted all the CSI stuff. I, he wanted slow motion and uh, a zoom on, on some data, which is uh, very, very, uh, um, um, I say, secret. And I tried uh, all my knowledge on this stuff and I found a working solution which is really nice, only specific to this scene. This was the fun part about it. So I just used this, the knowledge about this scene and recoded some algorithms and this worked pretty well. But um, then the, um, the judge will ask, um, so how good is this estimate you did? And I can't tell, I will never know. And so we need any kind of performance analysis. We should say this is the scene, this type of scene will usually give this result. Um, second part, we do have missing reference data, we do have missing performance measures. This is um, controversial, of course, but <coughs> I believe that we can find better performance measures. Performance does not only mean accuracy, it might also mean speed or graceful degradation and stuff like that. So there's lots of points in there as well. There are missing implementations. I hope IPOL will relieve this problem long term, and I think they're on a very good track. It's, um, uh, the um, chief editor is Michel... Um, uh, Morel in Paris, in uh, ENS Carchon, and um, he's a great guy. He's um, really, really good at both getting people together and doing the research, and this is a great combination. So I'm pretty sure that um, we will get this problem solved long term, and I also have some ideas what to do next year here. And um, then we have missing standard applications, so we just can say optical flow is used for this and this and this application, and then we can try a set of these applications. We know automotive is a big deal, and people concentrate on this at the moment, but there are also other things. And we have a problem of innovation versus consolidation. We did 30 years of motion estimation and stereo, and there is a lot of brainstorming going on, and there was a lot of brainstorming going on. So showing a solution which just says, this is working now for this specific scene, is very valuable because we see we can get an idea of what works and what doesn't work. But long term, we want to have a consolidation. So we want to see, okay, now we have 3,000 algorithms. Which ones are the one which will be in the textbooks in 20 years? And we have to find out that. And this is very important. And this, uh, I think it's, it's not like contradictory. So there's still a lot of innovation going on and this is very useful and this makes a lot of sense. But we also need to do work on consolidation, which sounds boring, because you look at all the stuff which has already been done and work with things which are not new and so on. But I think this is very important. So my provocative uh, take-home message is there is a lack of reproducible research, meaning you produce a paper, you produce code, you produce data, and then you publish the data only. 
And nobody will be able to reproduce this in many, many cases. It's not always like this, but in many cases it's like this. And this is a very big problem. And there is a whole trend of research which is discussed in nature blogs and so on. So this is a huge community for reproducible research. And there are journals popping up in all the disciplines. So this is a trend. And I think we should jump on this train and concentrate on reproducible research to get a more better consolidation here. So we are yearning, this image I call yearning, um, because we're going from the dark uh, left side to the light in the right. And um, this is an inspiration to open up discussions. I'm very much interested in your opinion, because there are lots of provocative points in there. And I'd really like to know your point and your, your ideas about these topics. Thank you very much.